All right, everybody, welcome back. How we doing? Ready for some more innovation? Yes? All right. Well, please give a warm welcome. This is the first time this man's presented at our innovation lab, so make him, make him feel welcome, make him feel loved. Social Media X Gaming on the Collision Course with Dan Zimmerman. Welcome, Dan. Test, test, all right. How's everybody doing? This is a little loud. Um, so this is my first G2E, my first time in Vegas, and I gotta say I've been ID'd about a hundred times since I got here. So uh, looking forward to being up here and then taking you guys through this. Awesome. All right, so to set the stage here, I'm gonna be talking a lot about gaming and social media, and I just wanna set the definitions a bit. When I talk about gaming, I think most of us are familiar, right? But when I say gaming, I'm talking about the traditional power players in the industry, but also, you know, the fantasy products and the, the startups on the periphery coming into the space. When I talk about social media, I'm really keying in on the, the core four uh, listed here, and of course, TikTok, which is rapidly growing. So the question I wanna ask is, really how will gaming compete with the titans of the industry on social media for attention, right? Can they coexist? Can they thrive alongside together? And before I get into that, I wanna give a little bit of background. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm up here, I'm, 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 I'm young, I'm, I'm the first time here, so I wanna give a, a little bit of background. I'm a 2020 Syracuse graduate. And my background really comes from working with Barstool Sports for, for four years as a as the social media and president of the, of the Barstool Syracuse brand. Um, I also worked for Tiki Barber's startup called Thusia, which was a, a live sports and entertainment content company. And so a lot of my background comes in the, the, the mesh between social media and sports. And my dad was a military background, so I've moved a lot in my life. Um, spent a lot of time uh, you know, across the country and eventually making outside the country. Uh, and one of the few constants in all these moves was the fact that social media was the way for me to connect and stay in touch with people and friends, uh, you know, place to place, month to month, year to year. But I started to develop a you know, strong relationship with social media that a lot of people my age have as well. You know, in high school, I was looking for a way to build my resume. I started a sports blog, thinking it'd just be a sort of pet project. Uh, it ended up being sort of my first foray into entrepreneurship, and you know, we, we started to build up a following for our posts through creating controversy and common threads on Facebook groups. Um, so that's you know where I got my first taste of the power of social media. When I came to Syracuse, you know, it was an adjustment coming over from London, uh, coming back to the U.S., being in college for the first time, and I was lucky to be joined by uh, my, my best friend David Rosen here in the crowd, who, you know, I'll touch more on that later. You know, we did really everything together. We spent all of our time freshman year working on on projects. You know, big big crypto guys. We had the mine in our dorm room using the free electricity. So you know what? You know, we were typical kids, I guess. But an opportunity came knocking when Barstool Sports was looking into college accounts uh, for content uh, on a local campus basis. And we turned that opportunity into a huge success with Barstool Q. So we were the first profitable college account viceroy for Barstool Sports, uh, doing deals with local and national brands, working with the athletes. I'm interviewing the, the quarterback here at the local bar. It was a very, you know, I got to play Dave Portnoy for a couple of years. So it was, it was fun. But, uh, you know, we were the quickest to triple our student population following. And, and David and I really got to sit in our dorm room and sort of sandbox out what people like and don't like, what people in this demographic take their phones or their wallets out for. And so we were able to build up from zero these, this platform to, to be really the, the major and most influential account in upstate New York, uh, where we really got not only the student base of Syracuse, but also the traditional civilian and, and, and follower of all the Syracuse teams and other you know, upstate New York teams. So that's where I come from, and that's why I want to talk to you today about social media and gaming, which I see is on a collision course. So social media has 295 million Americans monthly active users. I mean, that's a crazy number to think about. But how? How do they have these users? How do they have uh, the retention on these platforms? 
you know, nearly every action taken on a phone is a social action. In fact, that's what they were originally built for, right? To call and text your friends. Um, but now it's taken on a life of its own. Uh, but few apps in your in your platform or in your daily rotation are offline or individual, right? They're, most of them rely upon an, another end of the communication. Um, but what social media has done to really cannibalize this energy uh, is they create conflict that keeps the fire fueling onto the, the social content. So some of you may be familiar with The Social Dilemma. It's a documentary that came out last year. Uh, the Social Dilemma really takes a harsh look with, with a very harsh metaphor at how social media companies hijack uh, a user's brain and really can, can make sure that they stay involved and stay active. The best way that they do that is by putting them in conflict. You know, this picture, no matter where you stand politically, evokes a certain emotion uh, that a lot of people have, right? But on a lighter note, maybe we take this example, right? The return, we all watch the game on Sunday. And what this does is, is it finds people and it finds where they disagree, and what social media does is it puts them together to create whatever will end up in the most likes, the most comments, and the most shares. And those algorithms are built in a way where negativity and conflict frequently rises to the top. That can have people feeling like this. Or like this. Or sort of always in a state of like this. You know, when you're doom scrolling on your Twitter, you feel a lot of this anxiety. <laughs> and so, currently, the internet is a town hall, right? But social media gives everyone a microphone and nobody a vote. And what happens when everybody is talking over each other, yelling, looking to make their point, right? The loudest voice rights. That's not a, a true evaluation of what the social pulse, what the opinion of people really is. Because controversy equals virality, it doesn't mean accuracy. But what does the user really gain from spending their time tweeting at, you know, the person on the opposite side of the argument? What do they what stake do they have in the outcome? In its current form, users gain nothing. But what if that could change? What if a platform could change that? Social media will never be replaced. It, it can still be innovated upon, but it will never be replaced. And we've come to understand that. But what about a platform that replaced the like button with your vote? And giving the power back to the people to determine what is trending and what is truly popular, rather than just how many hate comments are in the replies. People use social media not just to give their own opinion, but also to see what the consensus is amongst their peers. It can be on the Celtics and Lakers, it can be on an election, it can be really any binary disagreeable point. But social media falls short of reflecting a true snapshot of public opinion. In fact, it wasn't even built for it in the first place. Here's an example of the worldwide leader in sports posting an image on their social media that's just that, it's just an image, right? Vote yes or no. You can't vote on this. This is literally just an Instagram post. Or, you know, a sponsored poll looking to, guarantee, to gain and derive really important value. This takes you to an external link. Nobody's clicking that. Nobody wants to spend their time doing that. But that's not to say interactive pulse content to see what people think isn't popular. In fact, it's the primary way that on, you know, on social media brands tend to provide digital content, you know, on a temporary basis, right? These stories, they expire in 24 hours, and you get to see, right? But, and even even people in the industry, you know, FanDuel and Sportsline, this is a constant, uh, you know, content mechanism for them. But the data collected on these interactive polls is truly meaningless and temporary. It expires, and the poster receives zero insights on what the voters, you know, are saying, who the voters are. The voters return only a small sample size where every snapshot, every snapshot of the results is an expiring and short-term version. What about a social media that felt more like a marketplace of public opinion, where the social currency was, you know, the prediction and accuracy rather than the likes and the like color? This would be more like a town hall with voting booths and debate forums rather than just screaming over each other, right? And this is where we get to the collision of gaming and social media. This is the opportunity. There's one thing missing from this town hall full of passionate people trying to express their opinions, trying to make sure that they're right, you're wrong. And that's an arena. 
And that's where my company, Verse Gaming, comes in. Verse is an immersive, peer-to-peer -peer social gaming company built around channeling that conflict into gaming. So the social arena built for betting allows users to bet each other with no house juice. We have zero vig on our on our odds, and every bet is with peers. So you're sharing these bets instantly, whether that's through the app, you can take a link and tweet that link, you can put it in a text message and send it to your friend. We make it as easy as possible to share our content. Rivalries are then born between friends and coworkers, between Ohio State and Michigan grads, between Yankee husbands and Red Sox wives, between Democrats and Republicans even, believe it or not. And when we say that social media isn't built to accommodate you know, the pulse feature of how public opinion feels, that's where we come in. We're built from the ground up to accommodate this sort of public opinion, this discourse that doesn't necessarily have any money attached to it, right? You have your debates, you have your votes, you can see even specifically what your friends are voting in, uh, just as you can see what your friends like on social. And a platform like this opens us up to not just sports and who wins Monday Night Football, but instead a wider audience that you may not find, you know, here in the crowd, uh, you know, the typical consumer that loves the Grammy and sort of religiously watches the Bachelor. Those aren't potential sports betters, but they are potential verse users. Of course, politics. That's another option that I think a lot of people, uh, you know, truly feel strongly about. It's a great, great example for an arena type. Verse is not going to aim to replace social media, as I said. It's They're baked into our culture, but we can complement them. But social betting is not new, right? We have the Action Network. The Action Network has done an amazing job building up a user base for bet tracking, for systems analysis. You know, I'm, a, I'm an Action Network user. Uh, Book It Sports uh, is a startup that recently came on the scene. I really like what they're doing. They're doing social pick tracking, opening up influencer marketing and influencer picking. And even DraftKings has gotten on the social wave. They've added friends, chats, and uh, pick tracking to their sportsbook features uh, just as recently as, la as this past May. But versus the first platform that really isn't built to take your money. We're, we're not looking you know, for you to lose and for us to win because Verse doesn't win when our users lose. So how does Verse win? How do we make money? How do we do what we do? Well, I wanna call back to one of the social media companies that everyone's familiar with, but Facebook. Take a look at just their North American users, 259 million. They make $82 per user based off four major data points that they collect. The age, location, gender, and the likes. Do you like Fox News or do you like CNN? These are you know, as, as basic as it gets data points for their users. They're able to build a tradition, you know, the, the first of its kind, targeted ad sales uh, model. And of course, we all know a $1 trillion market cap. They're doing all right, except for last night. But on Facebook, Steve on Facebook may not actually be Steve on Facebook. Steve on Facebook from Delaware could be Vladimir in St. Petersburg, right? There's no verification of who these users are. There's no limit to how many Facebook accounts someone could have. As a gaming company, or as a social game, as a social media company, we're collecting the same exact data points, but better than what Facebook would collect, right? We're collecting the age, location, the gender, and the interests. We're also collecting what Facebook can fail to do sometimes, which is the real-time opinion and the real-time prediction data around a topic that a user feels. We can also gauge their budget, right? How strongly do they feel it? Are they putting $100? Are they putting $1,000? Are they putting $10? These, these data points create a very valuable uh, database uh, uh, that, that allows us to utilize this data in a way very similar to Facebook's targeted ad sales. The difference is on Verse, just as a, you know, as a gaming company, just as BetMGM and, and DraftKings and anyone doing what we're doing in this space, they need to verify identities when you sign up for an account, right? You're not taking money without checking, and I'm sure there's dozens of booths here that specialize in that. But with Verse, we can verify the identity of each user, and there will never be a bot account on our platform. And this is where the collision course really lies, right? The product and the revenue streams, both of which are coming together to see a product that looks more like a social media and a revenue stream that looks more like a targeted ad sales model than it does traditional sports books, you know, winning money when the public loses. And that's what we're building here with Verse, is the first emotion, immersive social network built for, for betting, where you put your money where your mouth is and we're able to decentralize odds with public opinion. So we're replacing that like button with your vote and we're giving ad advertisers very valuable access to high fidelity data where they can create and get significant returns on their advertisements, even more so than potentially Facebook once we achieve scale. 
So in conclusion, social media is due for an update. Uh, and what we believe at Verse is in 2021 and beyond, gaming has both the opportunity and the demand to capitalize on this evolution. And my partner David and I look forward to spearheading that evolution of Verse Gaming. Thank you. We have, hang on, we gotta have some questions. That was fascinating. You gotta have some questions. Yeah, it's right over here. Can you hear me okay? Thank you so much. That's super interesting. Um, really exciting. Talk, can you tell us a little bit more about the legality of this and how it works? Like, is it intrastate? Is it within some states? How are you able to do game based betting versus player based? Certainly. So, whenever you know a, deal, a startup is dealing with entering this space, that's a big chief concern. And obviously, we'd love to just call this a game of skill, put it everywhere where fantasy is and get going. That's not going to be the case, and we are going to take a more layered model where we'll have a, a, a free-to-play baseline available in all 50 states, a fantasy model available you know, in uh, where we are able to give in the, the, the gray areas and some of the legislation and purchasing a license and others. And then, of course, a, a full license will be necessary for the peak version of what our product which it will be, which will be the direct peer-to-peer. -peer. So we're pursuing you know, all these different avenues. Uh, we're lucky to have Susan Hensel here in the crowd who's gonna be supporting us in that uh, you know, legal ende ende endeavors as well. Um, any other questions? Yes, thank you. Hey, thanks again. Um, where are you guys in your fundraising process and what is the general makeup of your team look like? Yeah, so right now we're very lean. We've been doing this for full time for a year since we were, you know, pandemic graduates. But we got started immediately. It's just myself and David full time. We raised a pre-seed round last summer, about two hundred thousand. And now, you know, here one of the reasons we came is because we are raising our seed round as well uh, right now. So we're looking to to put that seed round, you know, uh, in the books and, and get started bringing it to market uh, early next year. Right, anything else? Any other questions? Let's give it up for this first timer, G2E. Thank you. I think we'll be seeing this a lot more of this guy. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.